Okay, let's begin. Good evening, everyone. I am Paul Bramadat, and I'm the director of the CSRS at the University of Victoria. Welcome to our Thursday public lecture series. It's a series that allows us to showcase some of the wonderful research projects undertaken by our grad students and our faculty fellows. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to situate our conversation and our center at the crossroads of dynamic and complicated events unfolding all around us and very far from us. As an expression of our commitment to the most immediate neighbors and our the original stewards of these lands, I want to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And as an expression of our deep concern for what's unfolding thousands of kilometers away in Ukraine, I just want to acknowledge both their heroic resistance and also the impact this war is having on the mental well being of people there and here. Mm -hmm. And now I want to briefly welcome a scholar whose work connects ideas, struggles, and symbols from various places and various eras. And in so doing, I think, seeks to make the world a little more knowable. Jaya Anka is a doctoral student in the Department of Art History and Visual Studies in the Faculty of Fine Arts here at the University of Victoria. She entered the program with an MA in Visual Studies, also from UVic, and also focused on Phoenician art. Her work connects art, politics, religion, and culture, and is therefore perfectly at home at the CSRS. Jaya's promise as a scholar is reflected in the fact that she's won almost every fellowship and prize I can think of during her time as a doctoral student including the Bombardier Shirk Doctoral Award, the President's Research Scholarship, and most recently the Lindstedt Pollock Fellowship at the, at the CSRS, which is an award created through the generosity of one of our long-term scholars, Brian Pollock, and his partner, Heather Lindstedt, and which brings to the CSRS some of the very best emerging scholars of art history. And so without further delay, please join me in welcoming Jaya Anka to the CSRS digital stage. Jaya? Thank you, Paul, for a good introduction. And uh, it's it's an honor to be here. And just to follow up um, with the territory acknowledgement on another note of gratitude, I would like to thank the Center for this Religion and Society, the CSRS, for providing a continuing sense of community and inspiration during this past year, for the opportunity to gather and discuss ideas, especially during these extraordinary times in which we are living. This fellowship has been a boon both for mind and spirit. And so on this, I would also like to thank Dr. Brian Pollock and his partner, Heather Lindstedt, whose graduate fellowship provided me with the opportunity to join this community. I would also like to thank my doctoral dissertation committee, my primary advisor, Dr. Aaron J. Campbell, Dr. Sarah Bean, and professors Catherine Harding and Marcus Milwright along with the individual discipline and fortitude required of scholarship, it is their patience, guidance, expertise, and standards for excellence that are instrumental to how I approach my work as an art historian. And tonight, since we couldn't gather in person, I thought I would deliver um, my talk from the um, Department of Art History, where I am a student from the office of Dr. Astri Wright. So I would like to also thank Dr. Astri Wright for kindly letting me use her office while I am teaching uh, here this semester and uh, I feel connected to the place where it all began, so to speak. So without further ado, this portrait, a compelling portrait which now resides at the Courtauld Gallery in London is especially compelling for the rendering of the subject's distinctive textiles and dress, her long flowing white veil, and her delicate and alabaster visage, which is anointed by pink cheeks and reddened petite lips. Standing in contrast to the subject's unassertive presence is the heaviness of the spiked wheel upon which she rests her right hand. It might be easy to walk by this portrait of this unassuming figure without a closer looking. However, I suggest the portrait deserves more than a momentary or fleeting glance. I contend that it provides a critical window through which we are able to understand better the meaning of images associated, sorry, images of figures associated with the Islamic world, images which were created in Venice and forged at the intersection of cultural, political, religious, and artistic encounters between the most serene Republic, the Serenissima, and the Ottoman Empire at a definitive 
cultural moment in the 16th century. The proliferation of such portraits suggests that images of women who are perceived to occupy spaces on the periphery, in fact inhabited a central place within the world of 16th century Venice and throughout Italy and Europe. While images of women of the Ottoman harem that were produced in the 18th and 19th centuries have been studied extensively, those created in Venice in the 16th century have received very little scholarly consideration. Moreover, in the plethora of studies devoted to the oeuvre of Titian, few, if any, include an analysis of the portraits of women associated with the Ottoman Empire. These portraits, constituted largely by textiles and dress, and in particular by their definitive headdresses, become the signature of a type of exotic icon across a variety of media which carried enormous currency throughout early modern Europe. In 2011, Benjamin Schmidt employed the phrase exotic icon in his transmedia discussion of the parasol as a performative object that somehow became an oriental trope in the European imagination. I suggest that similar dynamics are at work in the central images of my study. Exotic icons could be fixed in their exoticism, yet indeterminate in their place and purpose. These combinations or paraphrases could be generative. Rather than sorting out the world, I contend that patrons, artists, and writers may have been complicit in collapsing differences and confusing identities. To borrow from Thomas da Costa Kaufman's term entangled histories, when referring to periodizations in art history, there is an entangling which produces an evocative type of veiling, which was then transcribed onto the body of what is considered within the art historical canon to be a traditional Renaissance beautiful woman or la bella donna. In my paper today, I examine three portraits which exemplify this idea of entangled histories. The so-called portrait of Cameria, the so-called Roxolana, and the so-called portrait of Caterina Cornaro. I ask, what could be the possible meaning of these representations for the viewer in the 16th century? And can they considered portraits, what might contribute to or inform such compositions, considering that elite Ottoman women would have been hidden from public view in spaces outside of the harem and palace walls, nor would they have granted permission to have their portrait painted. And why might women from the court of an Ottoman Sultan be depicted as the virgin martyr saint, Catherine of Alexandria? To begin these questions, Sorry. To begin to answer these questions, we will start with an examination of the so-called portraits of Mirama, or Camaria or Camelia, as she was known in European sources. I will then turn to images of her mother, Roxolana, as she was known in the West, and conclude with a discussion of images of St. Catherine of Alexandria, alongside another portrait believed to be of the Venetian noblewoman, Caterina Cornaro, to demonstrate how the representations or ideations of the four female figures became inextricably interwoven. The portrait, which measure, measures just over three feet tall by two feet wide, is today known by the moniker, the portrait of Camaria as St. Catherine of Alexandria. Created in Venice in the studio of Tiziano Vecellio or Titian, one of the preeminent artists of the Italian Renaissance, this is an atypical portrait of both Camaria and of St. Catherine. Cameria was the daughter of the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Lawgiver, or the Magnificent as he was known in the West, who ruled from 1520 to 1526. While extant portraits of Cameria are believed to be based upon a prototype by Titian, this is the only rendering wherein the Wheel of Torture is featured in a portrait thought to be the daughter of Sultan Suleiman. Daniela Sogliani claims that this attribute which identifies the figure with St. Catherine is a possible reference to the fact that the city belonged to the Ottoman Empire at the time. Through an analysis of different images, the thesis I will elucidate is that a more multivalent reading is possible. For the purposes of this research, it is compelling that one other portrait in which an elite woman is rendered in a similar way is that believed to be by, ma by many scholars to be a portrait of Caterina Cornaro as St. Catherine of Alexandria. 
This portrait was also created by Titian or a member of the studio. It is also significant that we have reflections of both Camarilla and her mother, Haram Sultan, or Roxalana or Rosa, as she was referred to in European sources. In the second edition of his Law Artist, published in 1568, the artist and biographer, Giorgio Vasari, recorded that Titian had produced portraits of Rosa, wife of the Grand Turk, at the age of 16, and of Camarilla, her daughter, with the most beautiful dresses and headdresses. The record more likely should have read that it was Camarilla who was 16 years old, for in 1542, Roxolana would have been in her late 30s. Vasari likely relied here on information from a Florentine artist and poet long resident in Venice and would have been easy to make a mistake of the sort for which Vasari is commonly noted to have set in. Documents may add other information regarding the works made by Titian and mentioned by Vasari because between 1552 and 1569, we find references to one or more paintings by the artist representing a queen of Persia. It cannot be determined, however, whether these letters refer to the portrait of Comedia or to that of her mother, Roxolana. In the case of the portraits such as these, since Titian would never have seen the sitters in the flesh, he had to follow a medal or another's artist's work as the model. And here we have um, a costume illustration of um, Queen of Persia. Also notable is the fact that together with portraits of Mirama's father and her mother, Camaria's portrait secured a place among 400 painted portraits of noteworthy men in the collection of the Italian bishop and historian um, Paolo Giovio. So what is known about this portrait of Cameria as St. Catherine of Alexandria? The identification of the woman in the painting as Cameria is due to Gior Grano's article of 1903, in which he examines the shoulder portrait in the Uffizi in Florence, which is labeled Cameria, Filia, the daughter of Solingen. It corresponds exactly in details of costume and headdress to Count Salern's picture. In the portrait of Camarilla by Del Altissimo, the woman is depicted in a similar dress and the same bejeweled headdress. The portrait is documented in Florence in February of 1557. Del Altissimo had been commissioned by Cosimo I de Medici during the years 1552 to 1564 to copy the portraits of this, his universal gallery of men of Paolo Giovio in his villa at Como which also included an entire room dedicated to a collection of the so-called Turks. A list of portraits owned by Giovio and sent from Rome to Como, likely compiled before September of 1547, includes a canvas that represents the Sultana, daughter of the great Turk. The painting in Giovio's collection has been lost. However, it is known through several copies, including that of Delicissimo and that from Ambra's castle, which is now in Vienna, which also records the head and shoulders in a more summative, precise way. Here, it is noteworthy that the woman is identified as the Sultan's wife, Umelia Silkar Solomani, Turk in Exor, something which Kenner pointed out in 1898. It seems safe to assume that the version known by Giovio and its successor described here are based on at least one of the prototypes by Titian. In 1969, Johann Wilde classified the painting of Camarilla as an original by Titian. However, just two years later, Harold Weavey contended that the smooth brushwork does not correspond to the master style the middle of the century. Specifically, what he describes as the weak drawing of the hands and the general dry handling of her red dress with the green leaf design and her long white veil are far removed from the autograph work of Titian as evident in the portrait Weavey calls the Venetian girl which today is known as woman holding an apple. Camaria's veil corresponds to that illustrated in Cesare Vecellio's costume book of 1598, which was identified as favorite of the Turk or Fimarita del Turco. The close fitting dress with long sleeves and buttons down the front corresponds to other costume illustrations also called Turkish woman or Dona Turca, 
as we see in Nicolas de Nicolet's uh, publication of 1580. While these print images appeared later than the central portrait of my study, it is possible that Titian or artists of his studio were making use of earlier costume drawings when he devised the originals to then turn to his imagination for the rendering of the faces. And we have another earlier one as well, which is contemporary with the portraits of the study. In we these words, all these fanciful portraits of women have a family resemblance of an ideal nature, for they cannot be said to represent specific individuals. And here, quite different so-called portraits of Roxolana from the north, uh, Edward Schoen, and again, Alton Del Altissimo, contemporary with the portraits. Referring back to the exotic icon, we see a large number of extant variations of the portraits of both Camaria and her mother, including examples belonging to the Mazovian Museum in Port Poland, the National Trust at Lachlok in England, and the Topkapi Palace and Para Museums in Istanbul. Her insights into why Mirama and her mother Horam, Horam Sultan would be sources of fascination for Europeans, I will provide a very brief introduction to the political and cultural context of the world of Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. The Ottoman Empire's vast territories were united under the rule of the House of Osman, dynasty being a critical component of imperial identity. Generally, both historians and art historians have focused on the males of the dynasty given their reign. It is important to note, however, that women of the dynasty often wielded considerable power and influence. The most famous of these women were the mothers of the reigning rulers, the Valid Sultans, Ottoman princesses could also influence events and increase the, both the prestige and power of the ruling family. The most notable Ottoman princess was Mirma Sultan, the only daughter of Suleiman. She was one of the children of Suleiman's favorite concubines, Koram. Koram was a slave until Suleiman freed and then married her. While it is beyond the scope of the current paper to explore how Sultan Suleiman altered traditional practices, Suffice it to say that it was the Sultan's love for Quram that influenced his reign and his relationships with his five sons and his only daughter. The Sultan's innovations affected the status of his sons, his daughter, and the elite of the empire because he established precedents that later Sultans would follow. Mirama grew up in the harem with her mother and her brothers. Suleiman arranged to have her married to one of his male favorites, Ushtum Pasta, who was promoted to the position of Grand Vizier, a position of the highest rank among his administrators. Mirama was approximately 17 years old when she married Bustam, who was about 20 years her senior, a date which would be contemporary with some of the portraits of my study. Europeans and Ottomans monitored the activities of Mirama and Bustam because of their involvement in the rivalry among princes as to who would succeed Suleiman. The elite of the empire during Suleiman's reign, primarily formed from his favorites, competed with another, one another in the area of architectural patronage. The number, location, and design of the structures that were commissioned conveyed status. Mirama's commission, sorry, Mirama commissioned two mosque complexes, and in addition, she supervised the construction of the mosque commissioned for her husband. The lavish nature of her commission testifies to her exalted status. Mirama was the first princess to commission a monumental mosque complex in Istanbul, which was highly visible from across the Bosphorus. The endowment deed of Mirama's mosque at Adirnakapi, registered in 1550, identifies her as her father's favorite and associates her character with the most celebrated women in Islamic history. Clearly a very portrait than those that were being created in 16th century Venice. By the final years of Suleiman's reign, Mirama was recognized as an extremely wealthy widow. Her in power increased with the death of her mother in 1558 when she inherited Haram's role as the Sultan's advisor. When Mirama died in 1578, she was the only one of his children to be buried with him in his turbe or tomb, highlighting that in death as in life, her status eclipsed that of her brothers. 
So this period of time from the 1540s to 1570s overlaps neatly with the dates that the central portraits of this study were created in Titian's studio. Therefore, the portraits of my study reflect the inevitable fascination that both Nefema and her mother Koram would have held for Europeans. And the portraits, necessarily imaginary, belie the considerable influence that both Mirama and Kurem wielded within the dynasty. And now a note about Roxolana. In 1536, when the royal wedding celebration took place, the Russian slave had been the concubine of Suleiman for 15 years. She was neither Turkish nor Muslim by birth, Abducted from her homeland, the young girl proved herself adaptable and quickly became Suleiman's favorite. The public was evidently troubled by the Sultan's attachment to one woman. Describing her unpopularity, Luigi Bassano, a Venetian who probably served as a page in the inner palace under Suleiman, wrote, Such love does Suleiman bear her that he has so astonished all his subjects that they say she has bewitched Therefore, they call her Ziadi, which means witch. For this reason, the Janissaries and the entire court hate her and her children likewise, but because the Sultan loves her, no one dares to speak. In his letter, the Flemish diplomat and ambassador to Constantinople, de Buzbeck, echoes this 20 years later when he writes that, Sultan's, that the Sultan's wife is commonly reputed to retain Suleiman's affection by love charms and magic arts. Roxolana, was the first Ottoman concubine to marry the Sultan and she cut an overtly conspicuous figure. The radical nature of called the reign of Roxolana and Suleiman made her a controversial figure in her time and the debate over her place in Ottoman history persists to this day. Roxolana's name is not known, her name is not known, nor are we sure of her exact birthplace or the date of her birth. Contemporary consensus held that she came from Ruthenia or old Russia, today a considerable region in Ukraine, then governed by the Polish king. Europeans interested in her in her origin called her Roxolana, meaning the maiden from Ruthenia. Some Ottomans came to believe that Roxolana was the daughter of an Orthodox priest. The only certainty about the young captive is that her birth family was Christian. From the early 15th century, the sultans fathered all their children with Christian-born females taken from the empire's borderlands and beyond. These women were converted to Islam and assimilated into Ottoman culture before being chosen to be royal mothers. Over the course of her life, Roxolana endowed mosques, schools, soup kitchen, hostels for pilgrims, shrines for saintly figures, Sufi lodges, public baths, and a hospital considered modern for its day. Her work far surpassed that of any previous Ottoman women, both in geographic reach and volume, setting a model for future females of the dynasty. Several of Roxolana's monuments still stand today, as do many of the monuments her work inspired. By deciphering the relationship between the portraits, we can begin to arrive at possible meaning of the portraits still believed by many scholars to be Camaria of St. Catherine. Weedy argued that someone other than must have been responsible for the addition of the large and clunky wheel, which turns Count Salern's picture into this St. Catherine. In a 2014 study, Cynthia Stalins explored how the cult of St. Catherine spread from early Christian Alexandria to Renaissance Rome. Her work provides an essential reference for understanding, or at least questioning, the resonance of images, both literary and visual, of St. Catherine, and further, how identities were articulated by using images of the saint. According to Stolhans, although modern scholars have successfully investigated Catherine's cult from many perspectives, in art history, she is often explained in a vague or generic manner, leaving a salient need for a more comprehensive picture which integrates various methods and sources to explain the popularity and the power of her image. A bit about St. Catherine. Catherine was a multi-purpose saint who appealed to both popular and elite audiences. By the middle of the 15th century, her cult was widespread that she entered the ranks of extraordinary saints, just as Jerome or Mary Magdalene. 
St. Catherine of Alexandria, whose cult appears in Vitae, an art datable to the eighth century, was properly, popularly proclaimed a saint of her martyrdom. While St. Catherine was a venerated female virgin martyr, she differed from other holy women in that she was championed for her supreme intelligence, using her mind and her words to combat her non-Christian antagonists. Catherine writes Jacobus de Vorang in the Golden Legend, Readings of the Saints, which was published in 1260, was an accomplished philosopher and possessed not only knowledge, but also an admirable eloquence. The issue of people portrayed in the guise of a saint is a long and fascinating one. I would like to highlight now four examples wherein saintly attributes are incorporated within or added to paintings, examples which I suggest have bearing on the portraits of this study. Here we have Narcissus at the Fountain by Altobello Meloni. This panel, now much smaller in size due to trimming, shows the beautiful Narcissus leaning over the edge of a fountain to gaze at his reflection. As recounted by Ovid in his Metamorphoses, the youth fell so deeply in love with his unattainable image that he died of grief. In the 19th century, the overpainting of a few areas turned the androgynous youth into St. Catherine with her wheel of torture, with that parapet that he's leaning on actually forming a spiked wheel. So such additions, which obscured the picture's meaning, were only removed a few decades ago. I would like to suggest as well that it is possible that as a St. Catherine of Alexandria, the portraits perform a type of intercessory role. The possibility of the primacy of St. Catherine in these images within both the Venetian and Florentine context, given where the portraits were produced and subsequently resided, must be raised, especially if there is any evidence that a work might have political significance. Viewers may have derived a sense of protectorship in St. Catherine, especially in relation to the advance of the formidable Ottoman Empire. Here we have an example where Pope Alexander VI, whose patron saint was Catherine of Alexandria, commissioned the disputation of St. Catherine of Alexandria before Emperor Maximilian. On her feast day on November 25th in 1492, the Muslim kingdom of Grenada in the Pope's native Spain had fallen. The painting expressed his hope that God, through St. Catherine, would give the Pope the same assistance in his crusade against the Ottoman advance. Now, Mazzolino also painted episodes from the life of the fourth century virgin and martyr in a chapel of the Church of San Clemente in Rome. And here in five episodes from the life of St. Catherine are painted on two walls. And in the last scene, following her persuasion of the Empress Faustina, and a group of 50 philosophers to convert to Christianity, Catherine survives the torture of the wheel due to the intervention of an angel, but she is then beheaded. The angels take her remains to Mount Sinai in the city of St. Catherine in Egypt. This area is sacred to all monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Related to this, I contend the portrait may be placed along a continuum in which two, and therefore members of his studio, were creating or working through compositions that drew upon and or referenced certain properties or qualities associated with Byzantine icons, a concept I pursue in my doctoral project. I draw your attention now to two images of St. Catherine of Alexandria that were created by Titian to underscore how distinct the portrait of Cameria as a St. Catherine would be. While there are no entirely extant autograph paintings of the subject, it is known that Titian painted St. Catherine on numerous occasions, both as a single figure and within larger compositions. For example, in 1648, Carlo Rodolfi mentions that at least tre invenzioni di Santa Canarina Martire che si sposa a Cristo diversamente dipinti or basically that there were inventions of St. Catherine as the Bride of Christ in diverse paintings. The first lost image of the saint as a single figure is documented as having been painted in 1540 for Alfonso Davalos and, is in, and its invention is likely related to the book of Catalina Virgini, which Pietro Arantino dedicated in that year to Avalos, a year very close to that in the creation of our portraits. The second painting, 
then around 1567 to 1568. On December 10th of 1568, Titian complained to Cardinal Alessandro Farnese that Cardinal Alessandrino had not yet paid him for the image he had sent him. This painting can be identified securely with the one now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, attributed to the studio of Titian. The Museo del Prado painting, which has barely been considered by modern scholars, shares similarities with the one in Boston. The physical type of the saint is identical, as is her rich silk clothing with a striking printed floral pattern. Jacopo de Vorangine popularized the legend of the saint, Princess of Alexandria, who refused to marry Emperor Maximilian in order to dedicate herself to God. The wheel with its spikes and the sword refers to her martyrdom, while her status as this explains the crown and to some extent her silk clothing, although these are also consistent with the decorative tendencies evident in later works from Titian's studio. So this is part of the reason that why this painting on the left thought to be of Caterina Terranaro as St. Catherine of Alexandria dated to 1542, I actually contend is a later work from Titian in the 1560s to be contemporary with other paintings of St. Catherine that Titian and a number of his studios were doing. So returning now also to the portrait of Camaria as St. Catherine of Alexandria. Even though the two paintings are unreal, um, unrelated stylistically, of particular relevance to this study is the fact that the scenario corresponds to the portrait many scholars believe to be in the Cornaro as St. Catherine. Here again, a copyist appears to have changed an ideal portrait into a saint by the addition of her attribute. In fact, I suggest that neither painting is, ne is neither necessarily very close to Titian. And in terms of the wheel being added at a later date, just this past fall, Julian Raby in an essay for Cornucopia determined that this attribution to Caterina Cornaro as a St. Catherine was fatally undermined during a recent restoration when it was revealed that the wheel was in fact a later edition. That being said, many scholars to this day accept this as an ideal portrait of the Venetian woman Caterina Cornaro who became Queen of Cyprus, Jerusalem, and Armenia, although positive evidence is slight indeed. In fact, in the inventory and com contemporary with the portrait, it was noted in the early part of the 17th century that the portrait was bequeathed to the gallery by Antoni de, de Medici in 1621. However, it was noted in that inventory that it was uh, La Regina di Cipri in Abito Nero, which means the, the Queen of Cyprus in black dress or in widow's garb. And in fact, the first citation that we see as this attribution to Caterina Cornaro as St. Catherine of Alexandria was only noted in 1792. So therefore, nearly 250 years after the date of its creation. So not only is the portrait thought to be of Caterina very different than that recorded in the 16th and 17th century, because on the left, she's shown in widow's garb, but it's also, this was the portrait thought to have been created in life by Gentile. <laughs> Something else which substantiates this is that an earlier uh, art historian, Joseph Rapsky, mentioned that in fact, this portrait of Caterina Cornaro as the saint was in fact a work, the um, Oriental queen, La Sultana Rosa or Rosalana, and that it was based something like this contemporary with that scene in the Ringling Museum in Sarasota. And I point out here the similarities between that thought to be of Caterina Cornaro in the Uffizi, that of the woman holding an apple, and that of the Sultana and um, several scholars and based on the inventories would also suggest that the portrait on the left thought to be of Caterina Cornaro is more likely uh, Roxolana. So the details of her dress are exceptional. The motifs and edging of her dress are nowhere to be found in Titian's surviving portraits of women. 
presenting us with particular challenges concerning provenance. The artist may be attempting to recreate a woven fabric, a damask brocade, which features a typical ogival pattern with a supplementary weft of gold thread. I suggest that the pearls reference the Byzantine or Russian Orthodox aesthetic. And we'll remember where Roxelana was born. In Russia, where both ecclesiastical and princely treasure survive in large quantity, the bold large scale patterns as we see here in the Uffizi portrait and floral repertoire of Ottoman designs appealed to local taste at the Muscovite court. Such precious fabrics may have made their way to the church collections of Renaissance Italy, collections that several artists were able to work with. However, it is also true that when multiple images were required, necessarily produced at one or several removes from the sitter or the original portrait, some details could be obscured or paraphrased. It is possible that the textiles and dress that construct this portrait are meant to conjure the relics of St. Catherine of Alexandria. One way to evoke the setting of a Bible story was to include textiles whose decoration looked Arabic in style. The vogue for depicting these textiles was fueled by the existence in the West of fabrics purporting to be relics from the Holy Land, dating from the time of Christ. Moreover, during the period under review, the visual language of allegory and metaphor embraced layers of classical, biblical, and more modern literary sources, often depicted with intentional ambiguity so that motifs on silks could also be interpreted as Christian story. So what are we to make of these confused collapse and identities? I argue that the two portraits in which a woman in oriental dress, as they were noted in the original archives, being transformed into a Saint Catherine of Alexandria are in fact not depictions of either Mirama or Caterina Fornaro. My hypothesis is that these images are in fact images of Sultan Suleiman's wife, Korem or Roxelana. A few images support this hypothesis. This as noted as Rosa Sulmani, also created in the 16th century, shows a striking resemblance to the portrait of Kimeri as St. Catherine, both in terms of headdress and color of clothing. This earlier print by Matteo Pagani, who is active in Venice, shows very similar features. I mean, there's modifications in dress, but looking at the facial features, there are things that are related. And as mentioned earlier, this portrait um, of a woman at the National Gallery shows facial similarities to that thought to be of Catalina Fornaro. And just to show how there can be this sort of fluidity or collapsing of identities here, the woman on the right, which I actually think was a working as well of Roxelana, is now at, enters and it sort of has this afterlife, if you will, through the 16th and into the 17th century. And, Caterina Cornaro, the aura of Caterina Cornaro is placed on pictures which um, may in fact not have been portraits of Caterina Cornaro, but they take on a life of their own. Perhaps the most compelling for me is when I discovered this image here. It is a rather what could be called unflattering French 17th, 17th century work, which was first recorded at Kensington Palace in 1818. The key lies in its inscription. Rosa, femme de Soliman, Emperor de Turc. In this paraphrase, the subject's features have become coarsened over a century or more of copying. Clearly then, the portraits provide visual evidence for the fluidity of identities wherein cultural imaginings could be transcribed onto the bodies of Carolina, Cameria, and Roxelana, identities which were collapsed confused and reconfigured. Essentially, such images constitute forms of paraphrase to perform as exotic icons. Throughout early modern Europe, there was a fascination with these extraordinary women, women who conceivably could serve as moral and imperial exempla. They were figures who were not only wealthy and powerful, they could both traverse and transcend the realms of geography, culture, religion, 
and the sacred and profane to inhabit liminal and ambiguous spaces. Given that their lives, or rather the narrative of their lives, took on an unmistakable aura which persists to this day, their images need not continue to inhabit the periphery of our scholarly inquiry. Thank you. Thank you, Jaya. Okay, so if you stop sharing, we can go. We have about uh, 20 minutes or so for some questions and comments. Who would like to begin? I wonder, oh, Rachel. <clears throat> Sorry, it's all the muting and unmuting. Uh, Jaya, thank you. I feel like I um, just learned so much about how an art historian thinks through things and presents things, and that was really wonderful. Um, so thank you. I, I want to ask a more kind of personal question because this is who I am. Um, and so I want to know what brought you to this topic and why you are particularly interested in exploring these portraits. Um, is there anything within your own um, story or background or studies or what piqued your interest? What brought you to this? Um, that's an excellent question. Thanks, Rachel. Um, well, they surprised me as well. Um, when I returned to graduate school uh, as a mature student, my, my goal was really to do my master's degree. And um, taking a few courses in the arts of Venice and uh, in Islamic art with Professor Milwright and the Arts of Venice, Aaron Campbell. Um, I became very interested in the spaces uh, between Italy and the Islamic world, and especially in the 16th century. And 16th century in Venice was a world that I find is much like our own today because we had the advent of the printing press. And Venice was one of the major centers of print in the 16th century. Of and an artistic center as well. And images that were created there uh, were very formative and they proliferated and were copied and they traveled throughout Europe. And I was very interested with this encounter with the Islamic world. And when I discovered these portraits, I became very interested in them and the stories that they held. And, and when I discovered that they had received very little critical scholarship, um, I thought there was a real opportunity there. And in terms of a, a personal note, perhaps there's something in that just because um, my family background is from different parts of the world. And, um, you know, my father's family being from Syria and Croatia and my mother's family from Ireland, I think I'm a sort of a, a being of that was kind of created. <laughs> and when I've been in Venice, I feel like I've been there before. And a part of Croatia where my family's from was actually under Venetian rule. So I, I think perhaps that I'm, I just want to go back to Venice. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good case for it, I think. Um, I wonder if in your larger project, the larger dissertation of which this is kind of a piece, if you situate it within the kind of critique of or assessment of Orientalism, I kept expecting you to bring that literature or that, that set of concerns into the analysis. It was, it kind of felt like it was there when you're talking about the ways in which these women would have been painted against kind of a backdrop of the imagination of the East by the West and the, the kind of meeting of these big civilizations or cultures. And I just wonder, does this play a significant role in your, in your broader analysis? Well, I think what I'd like to do, honestly, Paul, in, in that regard is in some ways it does take up Edward Said's call, right, to look at um, these these forces, these dynamics that were in play before the 18th century, like before, you know, the Odalisque took the hold of the imagination. And many studies have been devoted to studies of the Odalisque and, and what was happening in the 18th century. But the 16th century was a very different time. And um, you know, there, there are underpinnings absolutely in terms of this Orientalist lens, in terms of being a kind of fantasia. Um, but also at the time the empire and its relation to Italy, it was very different in the 16th century. And, and they were this, you know, this, the formidable advance of the Ottoman Empire was a very, you know, real threat. It was reported that, you know, the Ottoman Turks were at, at Rome's door. And, and so what's really interesting, and especially about images of these women, is they seem to fulfill a different kind of 
communicative need, if you will, than other depictions that we see of the terrible Turk, the Turkish threat, which by the way, Turks was the common nomenclature for Muslims in the 16th century. Um, and, and so there, there are sort of roots of that, yes, it, but I, I still believe that it, there's something about, there was a fear, but there was also a fascination and perhaps even an emulation um, and a respect um, for these figures and also for women who clearly wielded a lot of power and it's inevitable. And I know that, you know, there were letters, for example, going back and forth between Istanbul and, and Queen Elizabeth, you know, so the, they were, they were concerned. So I think there were very different dynamics in terms of images, even though that their ideations that were at play in the 16th century um, and that that deserves, you know, scholarly inquiry. inquiry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I think you're muted. I think Scott has to unmute people. There you go. Okay. Thanks very much, Jaya. That was fascinating. And um, just an easy one. When my uh, grandparents came from Ukraine for the first census, and I think the second census, they're from Western Ukraine, the their classification was Ruthenian. Uh -huh. That Western Western Canadian Western Ukrainians in Ukraine were Ruthenian, and it was Lviv to Poland, something like that. I don't know if that helps you at all. Well, it it is interesting because not very much is known about Roxolana's earlier day, but when um, they they did call her Roxolana, it means the one from Ruthenia, and so it's like. It's just being, you know, pieced together, and it, it is today is the Western Ukraine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, what else is going on? So, I mean, is 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 there something about Venice itself that is unique in the? I mean, Venice is an unusual situation geographically. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something about that space artistically that is distinctive from, say, Paris or Vienna in terms of the meeting? Because I, I, I know that uh, there was also concern in in around Vienna of the Turks being at the doorsteps kind of thing, right? So is there something about Venice uh, that makes it particularly kind of rich space for this kind of tension? Well, I think in in many ways, at this time when we're looking at when the portraits were created, primarily let's say between 1540 and 1560, um, Venice is, is unique in, in a few ways. When in some worlds, it's, it's true to say that the world was in Venice in the 16th century and it thrived based on trade. And so in many ways, it tried to um, be impartial. And, and also during this time, that's something that I didn't touch on this paper, but I do in, in my dissertation is I look at the ramifications of what's happening with the Council of Trent and discussions around religion and how again Venice tries to stay um, very much impartial and free of some of, 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 of these things. Now that's not to say though that Titian and his contemporaries, you know, Pietro Antino, Lorenzo Lato, that they weren't involved in some way with religious discussion. And that's why I think these images really do provide us with um, these multivalent readings that there's much more going on beneath this sort of, you know, what seems like to be an innocent surface. And, and could they be, you know, if it was St. Catherine of Alexandria as an intercessor, is it possible, you know, um, that there, and, and with properties of Byzantine icons, is there something that was going on in terms of a statement about conversion, you know, just given these women's backgrounds um, and that, you know, they weren't Muslim by birth and, and these conversions. So, so Venice, I think it just has all of these threads, this kind of um, internationalism that's happening by virtue of being Venice, the center of trade, and also where it's to survive, right? This need to be impartial. Um, it is fascinating to me though that, you know, you know copies were made um, by uh, Ferdinand in Tyrol and Cosimo de' Medici in Florence. So the fascination for these women went beyond Venice and just the fact that their portraits, both Suleiman's wife and daughter in a gallery of 400 portraits of men, these two women were featured. 
Yeah. So there's something happening in Venice and it's connections. And Venice, the, the connection too. I mean, Titian, his key patrons were also Charles V and his son Philip II of Spain, right? And so, and you know that there's that, what there's the tension between the Habsburgs and, and Suleiman. So I just, I think, and then France with the, I mean, there's, there's so much happening. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, Jessa. <laughs> Uh, Scott, there we go. Okay. Oh, um, I mean, I I know Venice in the Middle Ages, but I don't know much about uh, Venice in the in the 16th century. But uh, wasn't there a Doge around this time who had close connections with the with the Turks? There, yes, there I find it rather fascinating that. This woman, Istanbul, they had never been to Venice. Titian had never been to Istanbul. So really, why, you know, why did they decide to have these portraits done? Yeah, that's that's the million dollar question, Leslie. <laughs> and it's fascinating. And what's interesting to me as well is, um, well, within um, exhibit catalogs, for example, where they've looked at like the Sultan's World recently in 2015 or other exhibitions that look at, you know, the Renaissance and the Alderman world. To date, I haven't found a scholar who's really queried um, Titian's role in the rendering of figures from the Ottoman Empire and casting them within biblical narratives. And Titian played a central role in that, not only in these individual portraits, but in larger compositions in which contemporary or naturalized citizens to Venice were recasting themselves in Christian narratives. Um, and Titian produced many works like that. So I'm very, I'm intrigued by Titian's role in the creation and rendering of figures from um, the Ottoman Empire. And it started early in his career and for larger compositions that were placed uh, in in churches as well in Venice. And do you think um, there's any? It's in Catherine of Alexandria, and of course Alexandria was always important to the Venetians because it was the birthplace of Saint Mark. Do you think that has anything to do with why they portrayed her with a wheel? I do, I do, and the, you know, there's this these figures who, you know, when they're cataloged in the original inventories, it's women in oriental dress, you know, and they're, they're taking, they're borrowing probably from costume albums. Um, mm -hmm. There's the, the single leaf that are being printed. There's the albums to form these um, portraits, but it's almost like they're becoming fused or synonymous with, um, you know, these figures are standing in for, um, St. Catherine of Alexander, and as you mentioned, Alexander being very significant um, to Venice um, and, and the clothing in that, and, and part of, you know, what I mentioned in my talk is that the clothing being meant to uh, conjure um, sort of the, sort of like a, the, the act as metaphor sort of, you know, in layers and they're weaving in uh, this kind of ambiguity that could be interpreted as a allegory. And so, you know, why these figures as St. Catherine, um, that's, that's something else I need to pursue a little bit further. So I'd, I'd be interested in, you know, your suggestions as well, um, because I'm really looking at, you know, why these figures and, but again, they weren't noted as, you know, Cameria until long after they were yeah. created. So it's, it's, you know, what can I begin with? Like, what do we know for certain? So, um, yes, and, and, and I think that more images were created of, of, of Roxelana, just given you know, her notoriety. Thanks. Thanks, Chaya. Um, and Dominique, I think you asked a question in the, in the chat, but I wonder if, do you, do you feel Jaya has just answered it or do you want to put, repose it? Yeah, that's enough. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. speaking of uh, a master of allegory, we'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Pollock to uh, pose mm -hmm. his question. I say that because, of course, when he gives close readings of his paintings, uh, he's always teasing out the allegories in a really wonderful way. So go ahead. Not to put too much pressure on you or anything. Well, thank you. <laughs> Jaya, thank you. Uh, uh, fascinating. I love your topic. 
And one of the things that, that really has struck me is that these portraits um, are saying something about sovereignty and the sovereignty of women at a time when you you take a look at the at the actors you've got you've got Isabella of Spain you've got Catherine de Medici in 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 France and you've got Elizabeth mm -hmm. in England uh, Venice has close relations with all of these countries so is there something is there some kind of subtext going on here about sovereignty and women that's what a good question, Brian. And that, so that'll have to be the last question. So please uh, take your time. Oh, um, no, that, that's an excellent question. And, and, I, and I do wonder that myself, actually, Brian, and then just, you know, what's happening and who, one thing we don't know. So something that I have to piece together is I have to conjecture what the original viewing context for these portraits would have been because in all cases for each portrait of my study, that is unknown. So I'm basically synthesizing other points of information to create what I think were the viewing contexts for um, these portraits. And it's quite possible because so much has been done in terms of male patrons, but really that they were commissioned uh, by and for women, both. Yeah, and, and indeed, you do have some famous women collectors uh, shortly before this period, uh, obviously thinking of uh, is, um, uh, Isabella Deste. Yes, so, and in Austria as well, in Austria. Yeah, so the quest, there, there may be a question here of, is there some kind of commercial purpose for the artists going on? Mm -hmm. Anyway, just thank you. Thanks yeah. for so fast. questions. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's always useful to fo follow the money on these kinds of questions. And uh, I, I wonder if you could say one last anything about that. You know, the size of the commissions, the the um, the role that played in their broader political and social contexts. Well, I think just by virtue of the fact that we see images of these women play out across a number of media from, you know, print portraits and large scale paintings, that there was clearly a demand. And there are a large number of paintings and portraits and prints that are extant today. And that doesn't necessarily represent what in fact, you know, existed 500 years ago. But the fact that there was a demand for these images is evident. And when print became available, then it became uh, much more accessible or affordable to have these images because you're right, the painted portrait, these large scale paintings, that was for a very you know, small, more elite audience. Um, but we see that these were collected, you know, Paolo Jovio and Como, copies were made for Ferdinand and Ambras. We've got Cosimo de' Medici in Florence commissioning them. Um, and as well, you know, as Brian was saying, they, they have their, their consorts, you know, in Austria and in England and in France and, and, and elsewhere. And I would say just because as well that Titian was painting these. I mean, you know, this is the preeminent artist of Renaissance Venice and Italy and, you know, um, the artist, the one to, to emulate and watch. I mean, it, it says something about, you know, his, his patrons and the fact that he was in creating so many you know, images of um, Cameria, her mother, uh, and and St. Catherine as well. And it is significant, I think, that Pietro Antino wrote his life of St. Catherine of Alexandria in 1542. And then we see see this proliferation of, I mean, you have all the, just these layers, you know, um, and so something is, there is this demand for these images um, over this 20 year period. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking us into these images and to the world that produced them. And um, uh, so thanks very much for that. And uh, we'll talk to you more tomorrow at coffee. Yes. And um, Scott, if you can, or Talia, if you can show the slide for next week's talk, same time, same place. Thank you. There we go. So if you have an interest in Krishnamurti, um, please st stop by next time, uh, next week, and we'll see you then. 
Okay, everyone take care and congratulations, uh, Jaya. Bye.